What's going on guys? This is Rob and everybody gets the Sentry's powers. Not even lying. So check this out. This story initially opens up with Jessica Jones. What she's doing isn't overly important. She's literally installing a door. But while she's talking to her husband, Luke Cage, there's this massive explosion that goes off not too far away. Now, of course, she responds only to realize that Misty Knight and the Aberrant Crimes Division has already appeared there. Kind of a modern day reworking of the Heroes for Hire with some upgrades, if we're being honest with ourselves. The long and short of this is that between these two who have been kind of on again, off again allies in different circumstances, they kind of start going through and one, talking to the different people who had seen this explosion and two, trying to figure out what caused it. And where people are saying things like, our apartment got hit by laser beams and so on and so forth, there aren't really any clear cut answers as to what's happening. And in the world of superheroes, it could be basically anything. But one of the things that ends up going on here is that in this conversation between Misty Knight and Jessica Jones, one of the things that Jessica Jones says is that a family perished from the explosion in Columbus, but 18 year old Ryan Topper is yet to be accounted for. Now, one of the things that I want you guys to do over the course of this video is I don't want you guys to look at this from the perspective of a Marvel comic. I want you to look at it from the perspective of heroes, if you ever saw that show, and the hunt for Gabriel Siler, right? Like, because this is basically that, right? That's effectively what this story is. And so one of the things that goes on here is you actually switch to earlier that day with a girl by the name of Mallory Gibbs. And this girl is of course somebody who has cerebral palsy, so she can't walk, but she does have kind of a really cool social media brand where she got like really into calligraphy when she was younger. And so the result is that she just kind of like records herself doing calligraphy. I don't know if that's a thing. If it is, it sounds dope and I'll probably check out a couple videos about it but in the midst of her doing this and basically recording everything she gets a glimpse of the moment when the century fights the hulk in world war hulk and then suddenly she lights up right like these powers just seemingly come out of nowhere she goes flying through the apartment building like a bat out of hell lands in the laundry bin but when she's in there everything's frozen now one of the things that i also want to establish here is that the century's powers historically in marvel comics have been very ambiguous sometimes he can alter reality sometimes he can't sometimes he can fly faster than the speed of light sometimes he can fly as fast as the speed of sound he was very much a character whose abilities were contextual to the story that was being written something people absolutely hated about this century, right? People just despise that element to his character. And so one of the things you're gonna notice over the course of this is Marvel is actually consolidating down the nature of the century's powers and establishing exactly what it is that he can do through each one of these people who are gonna pick up his powers. And so one of the things that establishes here is that the century effectively had the ability to freeze time. Either that or she's moving so incredibly fast that everything seems like it's frozen. But it's most likely the former, right? The fact that she was able to effectively freeze time. And the reason why is because when that happens, she ends up like snatching these people up and just like racing them out of the building when she starts to realize that the whole building is about to collapse. And so when they reemerge, they don't really know what's going on, right? I mean, it's like that scene from, what was it, X-Men Days of Future Past, when Quicksilver was racing everybody out of the building, probably one of the greatest scenes ever in the history of a comic book movie. But then like, once everybody's basically rescued, Mallory's just kind of out there, just looking at stuff and that's it. Once she races off, everything seemingly snaps back to normal, which is why nobody looked up and said like, Who's that girl that's flying away with a streak of yellow behind her, right? So a pretty neat way to kind of allow this scene to unfold without anybody having any indication of what went on. Now, one of the things that happens is that the belongings of Mallory are basically gathered together by Misty Knight and Jessica Jones. And the reason for this is because one of Mallory's friends had been in the apartment building when everything went sideways. And she had actually told Misty and Jessica, there's a girl named Mallory who is handicapped in that building. You need to get her out. And so once they have all these belongings brought together, using of course the advanced technology at their disposal, Misty Knight's able to pull information from the cell phone. She sees the recording and then realizes, okay, this is the second person to gain the powers of the century, right? That like Topper has them, now Mallory has them. And so at that point, you switch over to another guy who's actually a DoorDash driver, right? This guy's name is Farad. And this guy, once he drops off the DoorDash, because of how he looks, this guy's like, okay, so like you're a mutant, clearly. And then doesn't give him a tip, which is just kind of a dick thing to do, right? Like just 
that's pretty crappy. But one of the things this guy says is he doesn't really have any special powers, that he simply just looks different. Now that's an important thing to understand. And the reason why is because after his delivery is done and his day's basically over, he goes to the gym to hang out with his friends, play some basketball, that kind of thing. But what ends up happening is that in that moment, he glimpses the century ripping Carnage in half. Now, unlike the Century fighting the Hulk, which is just well known in the Marvel community, this one needs a little more explanation. So in Marvel Comics, the Century has kind of like two origin stories, if you want to call it that. There's the original Paul Jenkins and Jay Lee, the Century story, which is initially supposed to be a one-off, right? Like that was it, like it was done. He was never going to be seen or heard from again. But because of how popular he was, Brian Michael Bendis, when he started New Avengers, the first and second story arcs featured the Century. The first story arc is where this one comes from, when the Century basically escapes from the raft, grabs the Century, flies him into space, and tears him in half. It's one of the most iconic scenes from the Century, and we actually covered it. If you're interested in, in seeing that story, I'll have a link to it here at the end of the video. But the thing about this is that once this happens, much like what we saw with Mallory, suddenly these powers manifest. But as opposed to it being like this kind of massive explosion that basically levels an entire building, it's enough to do damage in the general area but then seemingly, this guy develops telepathy. He starts hearing the thoughts of the people around him. Not only that, he develops super speed. Now, super speed seems to be kind of the standard thing, right? Mallory obviously had it, this guy clearly has it, and he just races super fast and ends up running to a park in order to kind of calm himself down. At that point, he's met by Topper. And this is why I say heroes and Siler, because as those of you guys who watch the Heroes show know, in like the first season, Siler was the bad guy and he was going around killing people that had powers and taking their abilities. The worst thing they did was reveal him. That was a terrible decision. He should have just stayed this like clandestine, mysterious guy for at least another season. But be that as it may, as the two of them are having a conversation, this guy, Ryan Topper, right? He like literally introduces himself, that kind of thing, and kind of explains what's going on to Farad and simply saying like, most likely what happened here is you had a glimpse of the Sentry's memories and then gained his powers. And that in doing so, you now have a portion of what he's capable of. Now, here's one of the other things that I want to explain here, because by this point, you guys are probably kind of like, okay, but like what's going on with the Sentry? Robert Reynolds the Sentry died during King and Black, right? He kind of came back as like a weird vessel possessed by demons type thing in the Strange series with Clea, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is that Robert Reynolds is dead and has been dead. And in fact, during the Valkyries tie-in for King and Black, he moved on to the afterlife, right? So Marvel officially killed him off. And so the result of this is that his power still kind of remains for whatever reason that makes sense to nobody but Marvel and different people are inheriting his abilities. That's effectively what's going on here. And so the result of this is that as they're having this conversation, literally Farad initially thinks that like Thor's the most powerful Avenger. Of course, Ryan corrects him and says, no, 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 it's the Sentry. And when he asks him, what powers did you get? His response, at least Farad's response is, I don't know, like running really fast, but also telepathy. And so the response of Ryan is, it doesn't really matter. I want them all. And he immediately attacks this guy, right? Again, just a huge reference to Silent. And so the fight between the two of them is actually pretty interesting for a couple reasons. One, because what we're established here, at least what we're given here, is that Ryan Topper has a much better understanding of these powers than Farad does, which makes sense because seemingly Topper's had them for probably a couple weeks or so, right? Farad just got them like 15 minutes ago, right? If that, right? So it's just one of those things where like just using them for a longer period of time. But even then, right? Like what you end up getting is suddenly almost like this, uh, ingrained memory where like Farad just inherently knows how to use these abilities on some level. Now we could argue this to just the nature of the plot, or we could say it's tied into the century's memories. It's one of the things that we don't fully know. And then honestly, it doesn't really matter all that much, right? Like Topper gets hit with heat vision, which is kind of a cool thing to see. And then like Farad refers to Topper as a psychopath because Topper simply wants to take out everybody that has the century's powers and absorb them into himself. Now, the other thing here is that Topper Topper also, much like most every normal human out there, seems to just have a vendetta against Farad because like he's a mutant, right? It's kind of cool that they're throwing that in there, especially given everything going on with Fall of X. Not overly important, but it is good to see this kind of being thrown in a little bit, given the context of everything 
that's going on in Marvel Comics. But one of the things that happens is that as the two of them are fighting, Farad doesn't have any technique. This guy's not a fighter, right? And he's certainly not like the Sentry, and he's not like Wolverine or anybody like that, although the Sentry was really more a brawler than like a more skilled fighter or anything along those lines. But Topper literally asked Farad the question, like, didn't your dad teach you how to fight? Because he taught me how to fight, and he rips his arm off, right? And then just like absorbs his power and like, that's it, right? He's just like one less rival. I hope the others will be as easy to find and that's it. And so what you end up doing is jumping to the moon and you basically have Mallory who's just been on the moon this entire time, kind of saying like, this is the only way nobody gets hurt. But in the background, you seemingly have three other people who have also gained the powers of the century. And wouldn't you know it guys, what a coincidence. One of these guys looks like Steven Yoon, the exact guy who's gonna be playing the Sentry in the Thunderbolts film. My goodness, what a coincidence. Man, if only there was a way to know exactly how this story's going to end. With that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this to an end. Marvel, stop being lazy. I will catch you all later. Peace.